So uh, again, my name is Dan Kilbride, and I am a professor of history, and I also am the uh, associate director of the honors program, and I'll be the incoming director of the program in fall. And so we have a couple honors capstone presentations here, and uh, so I'm happy to be here. So I think uh, unless anybody objects, we can go in the order uh, from the uh, from the program, which would be uh, Aaron going first, and then Josie. Uh, then third, Maggie, and then Tristan and Celeste. Is that okay with everybody? All right, great. Um, so our first presenter is Erin Ahern. I don't know if I pronounced that last name correctly, Erin. I'm sorry if I did not. Erin, um, uh, do you know if uh, Professor Yost is supposed to join us? Um, I am not sure. He, did, he didn't tell me if he was, so I, I wouldn't wait. Okay, all right. Um, well, um, okay, then we, why don't we do that? So Erin uh, will be presenting um, her presentation, uh, which is entitled Victim Race and Subject Profi Political Affiliation on Perceived Police Brutality. So Erin, take it away. Thank you, I'm gonna share my screen. And my power keeps going in and out. So just a heads up if I, my computer dies, it should be good now, but I just wanted to give that warning. <laughs> okay. So yes, my name is Erin Ahern, and this is my honors project. I did it through the psychology department, and I was looking at race and political ideology and how they affect perceptions on police brutality. So the relevance for this topic and my interest really does come from um, the current media and all of the controversy that is surrounding police brutality right now, um, especially after the killing of George Floyd, there has been a lot of conversations in the media um, surrounding police brutality. Sorry, <laughs> it's loud. Um, but there's been a lot of controversy between the Black Lives Matter movement and the All Lives Matter movement. And we've also seen an emerging Blue Lives Matter movement that's kind of focused on police lives. So in looking at some of the past research for race and policing um, a lot, pretty much all of the research suggests that Black individuals are discriminately treated in all areas of the justice system compared to white individuals, um, all the way from being stopped and being arrested to the actual conviction and sentencing, black individuals are discriminately treated. And this is also seen in police brutality, black individuals report more physical and verbal um, brutality from police than white individuals, and black individuals are also more likely to be fatally shot. Um, and some theories on why, the major theory that considers why um, black individuals are discriminately treated comes from the institution of when pol policing was originally um, created. It was created in a time, um, a slave era, where um, white people were being protected from black individuals. So a lot of theorists believe that there is a longstanding tension between black individuals and the police because of how the police were founded. Also, in looking at some of the research regarding politics and policing, research really suggests that people who identify as conservative or Republican view police much more favorably um, than people who are liberals or Democrats. So conservatives tend to see police force as just, whereas liberals tend to see police force as more um, excessive or mis as misconduct. And then in looking at the intersection of race and politics, there's not a lot of research that really um, indicates how these two factors interact and whether one factor is more significant in perceptions than others. So that's what I'm interested in studying. So like I kind of already covered, my study is really looking at race and political affiliation. So I'm looking at the race of the individual in a police encounter as well as the political affiliation of the participant actually taking the experiment. And my dependent variable was the percep perception on police brutality. So for my study, all participants completed the study virtually on Qualtrics due to the pandemic. 
Um, and the first thing participants did was indicate their race and political ideology. Um, they also completed the right-wing authoritarianism scale, which has 22 questions, and they're aimed to show whether um, someone has high reverence to authority and um, how, how much they align with conservative ideals. And after completing this demographic information, participants were given one of two vignettes. It was random. They either received a, a vignette with a white driver named Todd Adams or a black driver named Deshaun Adams. And down at the bottom is the black um, driver vignette. And besides the race of the driver, the vignettes were identical. Um, so the vignettes depict someone being stopped for speeding on the highway and then when the officer is running the plates of the driver, they find that the driver has an expired license. So they come back to the car and they see the driver with their hands in the glove compartment. So the officer reacts and tases the driver. The driver has a seizure and because of the seizure, the driver is suing the officer for police brutality. So that's kind of an overview of the vignette. So after participants read the vignette, they answered um, several different questions, all aimed at measuring um, perceptions of police brutality. So they rated how justified they believed the tasing was and how, how much they believed that the driver deserved to be tased. They also rated how, how legitimate they felt that a police brutality charge was and how likely they thought a jury would convict um, the officer for police brutality. Um, they also rated how they felt the officer could have diffused the situation better or if they thought the officer diffused the situation justly. And they compared the responsibility of the officer and the driver and rated um, which one they believed was more responsible in the outcome of the situation. And lastly, they rated the extent to which they believed that the tasing was influenced by race. And I don't have this in here, but I also have two fill in the blank questions in my um, experiment. So one was if people rated that they believed the officer could have diffused the situation in a more just manner, they were able to explain how. And the other, the last question of my survey was blank lives matter. And um, participants were asked to fill that in with whatever first popped into their head. So getting into my results, um, I conducted a two-factor analysis of variance, and for looking at just the effect of race, um, race was significant in determining when, whether individuals believed that the tasing was affected by race. So participants who read the vignette with the black driver were much more likely to believe that the tasing was influenced by race than individuals who read the white vignette. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, and then looking at political ideology, I found a few more significant results. So conservatives believed that the tasing was more justified than liberals did. And they also believed that the driver deserved the tasing more than liberals did. Um, similarly, they, they were more likely to believe that the officer justly diffused the situation, whereas liberals were more likely to believe that the officer could have diffused the situation in a more just manner. Liberals were also more likely to give the officer more responsibility for the outcome compared to the driver than conservatives did. And liberals were also more likely to believe that the, um, that the tasing was influenced by race than conservatives did. I also, I found an interaction effect between race and political affiliation and looking at whether participants believed that the outcome was affected by race. And this is what the table and graph shows. But basically for the white vignette, both conservatives and liberals weren't super likely to believe that it was influenced by race. But in looking at the vignette with the black driver, liberals were much more likely to believe it was influenced by race than conservatives. And you can see this here in the different slopes of the line and how this light blue line here is for liberal and how drastically different it is from the conservative line. I also ran a few correlations. Um, the first correlation I ran was between political ideology and that right-wing authoritarianism scale, just to see if 
there was any correlation. And there was a very high correlation for that. Um, people who are conservative tended to have much higher right-wing authoritarianism scores than people who are liberal. And I actually did one analysis looking at right-wing authoritarianism, but like the effect on the police brutality perceptions, but it was almost identical to the political ideology. So my main focus was political ideology, but it was very correlated. And I also looked at the correlation between political ideology and participants' answers to the Blank Lives Matter question. There was also a correlation here in that conservatives were more likely to fill in that blank with all, and liberals were more likely to fill in that blank with black. And interestingly, I didn't have any case of um, participants filling that in with blue. So in considering what these results mean, these results really show that both race and political ideology do influence the perceptions of police brutality. And it helps to give some context to the current news that we're seeing in the current controversy and really understanding why there is such a difference in belief when it comes to police brutality that it could really be impacted specifically by political ideologies and the um, greater reverence that conservatives tend to give towards police whereas liberals are more likely to see acts of force as excessive and as brutality. And then just to finish up some limitations and further research, um, my greatest limitation is definitely sample size. Future research um, would hopefully include a greater, more extensive sample size to get more impactful results, stronger results that would be more general, generalizable to um, different communities. I think for further research, it would also be interesting to consider how these results may impact individuals' um, opinions towards different policies on policing, on brutality, how, how the intersection of political ideology and, and opinions on policy could interact. I also think it'd be interesting to consider participant race instead of just the driver's race and see if that would influence any results as well as different acts of police brutality. Um, since my, my study was focused on tasing, a lot of police brutality in the media um, includes shootings. So that could be a very interesting um, topic to consider as well. And lastly, considering more of the right-wing authoritarian authoritarianism, um, because it kind of fell in the background of my study, but putting more putting more emphasis on that correlation could be interesting. So these are my citations and thanks everyone for listening. I'm open to any questions anyone might have. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Aaron? I have a question. I'll go ahead, Todd, and then do Olivia. And then Aaron, Kathleen. was was there any were any of your results surprising to you? Um, <laughs> I'd say that what I was most surprised about was that I had results because I did a very similar study um, last year with it wasn't on police brutality, but it was on jury convictions, and I didn't find any results. So I was surprised to see um, that there was such a difference, especially with political ideology. Um, but I'd say that the results definitely um, aligned with my theses and my hypotheses for the study. But I was surprised to see that no one said blue lives matter, because that's something that I've heard a lot in the media recently. Um, so that was a surprise to me, but my actual results, not really. Uh, I think uh, Olivia, uh, you had your hand up, I believe. Oh, I was just giving you the clap thing. I like the presentation. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure what that meant. And Kathleen, was that the clap uh, too? Was that yeah, that was the same as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Erin, you kind of anticipated uh, that was Todd asked the same question I wanted to ask, but the thing that, that I thought was odd was um, the, 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 I don't know if the failure is the right word, but the failure of anybody to write in Blue Lives Matter. Um, I, this is probably a very sound scientific method sort of question, but 
Any speculation on why people either went for all or black and nobody went for the blue? That's a good question. And I honestly am not, I'm not sure because I would have expected, especially since it was a police brutality case and not some other sort of um, racial violence case, since it involved police, I was very, I, I was very surprised about that. And I don't, honestly, I have no idea. A lot, but I did find that some conservatives put Black Lives Matter in, um, and some people just didn't fill in that blank. So it could have been that people who wanted to say that just didn't answer the question. Um, but I'm not. I'm, I was honestly very surprised by that. Yeah, I mean, just just anecdotally, I mean, I think I hear Black Lives Matter and all lives matter a lot more than I hear blue lives matter. So maybe that's, maybe the all lives matter is just sort of the default alternative to black lives matter. I don't know, but again, totally unscientific opinion. Um, no idea. Um, any, uh, any final questions for Aaron? All right, Aaron, great job. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. On the clap emoji. Um, so our next uh, presentation will be uh, Joji Joji Schumann. Another this is another honors capstone project. Is that right? All right, excellent. Yes. Um, and this one was uh, supervised by Dan Reynolds in education. And the, the uh, title of Aaron's, or, I'm sorry, Josie's presentation is the extent to which <laughs> anti-racist English teachers still conveyed racism. So Josie, we are in your hands. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I am uh, uh, Josie Schumann. I am a uh, senior this year, um, double major in English and um, adolescent young adult education. So before I kind of jump into the content, I kind of wanted to share a bit about why I wanted to do this study. Um, I am very passionate about empowering um, uh, students of color, but I, I recognize that as someone who has a positionality um, where I have greatly benefited from white privilege that I can kind of, that can kind of um, come into conflict with this passion. Um, so therefore, um, I've kind of learned that I really have to make a conscious effort every day to be um, uh, anti-racist in my classroom. Um, I've learned that it's not enough to just be, to just not be racist, but that we kind of have to actively um, work against uh, racism. Also, since this idea of anti-racism is fairly new and actually kind of uh, uh, radical, um, it's really an ongoing process. And what I mean by this is that we're all going to kind of make mistakes along the way. Um, I believe there's a lot of fear and anxiety, um, especially for white people, um, when, you know, to say or do the right or wrong thing when it comes to having conversations about race. And I really think we need to move away for that, move away from that. And when we make a mistake, just own up to it and then um, move forward and learn from it. Um, so as a result of this, um, my goal with this project is really not to shame or indict any um, of the teachers in my study as racist um, individuals, um, but rather I really want to talk about the idea, practice, or policy that was seen in the classroom as racist. Um, my purpose here is really to support and empower these anti-racist teachers to be um, to be reflective on their practice and also take take responsibility for their actions. Moving into kind of my lit review, um, I define the terms racist and anti-racist based on Ibram Kendi's 2019 book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And so while he talks about anti-racism in kind of more of a general context, I really tried to narrow down the um, research into kind of my field and talking about um, anti-racist English teaching and what that kind of looks like in the classroom. Um, and so the work of anti-racism, the one big tenet I really want to talk about is that it really emphasizes the importance of calling out and naming ideas, practices, and policies that are racist. Um, Kendi tries to really steer clear of terms that we use a lot like unintentional racism or unconscious bias, um, because these terms really just protect people from um, acknowledging the reality that, you know, what they said or did was racist. And so in the, um, in the case of education, um, all the teachers that I've really interviewed so far, they really all had great intentions. 
questions. Um, however, at the end of the day, um, the question is, you know, how much does this matter? Um, it's kind of this age old debate of intent versus impact. Um, so whether I'm intending to be racist or not, I think that the effect on the student will kind of be um, uh, similar. Moving on to the next um, tenet of anti-racism is that it really aims to empower um, uh, students of color. And I think it can be very easy for English teachers, especially to kind of tell the same stories about how people of color um, throughout history have been victims of racism, um, uh, uh, discrimination and kind of things of that sort. And while this is extremely important to talk about, these issues demand conversation and they demand action. Um, Anti-racist English teaching really warns against this idea of telling a single story. Um, as teachers, we cannot be continually telling our students of color um, how bad they have it because they already know. Um, so instead, we really need to highlight the beauty, the joy, the um, richness of the, um, uh, you know, experience of being a person of color to kind of tell a more well-rounded story. So from this research, I developed my research question, which is what I have here in brown, is to what extent have anti-racist English teachers still conveyed racism? And so, um, and so kind of in other words with this question, um, I'm kind of just looking at, you know, how might teachers still convey racist ideas, even in their best, um, best, intentions to be anti-racist. And so what I did is I investigated this question by interviewing white high school English teachers who teach in schools with a high percentage of um, uh, students of color. And I was specifically looking at the experience of black students. Moving into my methodology, the methodology that Dr. Reynolds and I kind of thought would be most effective to help us answer our question is this um, method called narrative inquiry. And so we modeled our um, we modeled our research um, off this article by Puzio et al. And that one was called "Creative Failures in in Culturally Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy." And what they explain in that article and kind of how they go about things is that narrative inquiry is based on the idea that our lives are really just a series of lived stories. And that storytelling is a very natural way for people to reflect on and also understand their lives. Um, and so I have also a quote from the article that I thought was powerful. And basically to kind of, you know, sum up that quote, it's for anyone who's been in the classroom, who's ever taught, um, we know that it's messy. You make mistakes, things don't go as planned. You have to be flexible, adaptable. And the really cool thing about this method is that um, it lets all of that become um, part of the data. The other really major tenet that I want to talk about is there's um, a sense of collaboration between the researcher and the um, uh, participant. And so through this process, I was really able to create the data together with all of the teachers that I interviewed. And so what um, I really mean by that, by um, creating the data together, is what I did is from my research question, I posed um, I, I posed this question to teachers. Um, so I asked teachers to tell me some stories about a time when they tried to teach a lesson that they thought was anti-racist, but it was actually misinterpreted, resulted in tension, or failed in some way. We went through a few of these experiences, and then we agreed on one to three stories that they wanted to move for forward with. Um, then I asked the teacher to actually describe this experience in writing. So they kind of wrote up like a 500 to 600 word piece on like what that experience actually was and you know how it was for them. And then these stories became our data and our field texts um, that we kind of um, made as a team. And that's what I used to analyze all of these stories for common themes. So from this, um, the data that we found was I actually was able to interview 12 teachers from 11 um, different types of schools. Um, I have those listed there. And then all of these teachers had a range of experience. So ranging from three to 27 years. From those 12 teachers that we talked to, seven of them actually went through and wrote their stories. And out of those seven teachers, we actually were able to get um, 11 stories. Um, so some teachers actually wrote more than one. Um, as far as the results go, um, we found three really main themes um, kind of in all of these stories about how and why these anti-racist um, uh, uh, lessons did not go as planned. And so for this presentation, um, what I'm going to do is I'll briefly kind of explain each theme and then I'm going to show you a um, quote from a story that I think best shows that theme, even though the theme may have may um, have been seen in more than one story. 
So the first thing that we really found was a lack of teacher knowledge and preparation. And so we found this theme in, a, in eight out of the 11 stories. Um, and what I kind of mean by this is teachers really tried to jump in um, and kind of have unplanned conversations about race and, and race and racism. And they kind of failed to add any context to what they were talking about or ground it with kind of um, with a text, either um, informational text or uh, literature, which is really, really important um, in the um, English classroom. Also, even if teachers kind of did show some, um, you know, knowledge of these topics, a lot of times it was a very superficial understanding. Um, and we also found there was a lack of anti-racist training in um, teacher preparation programs. So kind of like what I'm in now here at John Carroll, um, but also, you know, um, when they're actually at their jobs, um, school-wide, um, uh, like professional development opportunities. And so the one story that I think really best exemplifies this theme is one that we called um, surface level uh, literacy in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird or uh, TCAM if you're a big um, English nerd like me. And so what really happened um, in this story was that the teacher was trying to be anti-racist actually by um, teaching this book. And the teacher thought this was a good choice because the book has some uh, uh, representation of uh, people of color. And she also actually drew from um, a resource called Facing History, which is kind of um, known for being more social justice oriented. And so she actually brought those into her lesson. Um, but she kind of soon found that it didn't really go as planned. And so what the teacher wrote in her story was, because a lot of my resource materials came from that organization, I assumed that I was covered and did not have to think any deeper about the racism and structural structural inequity that the text refers to, nor interrogate why we barely hear the voice of, of Cal, Calpurnia, the black housekeeper. And so as you see from this quote, the teacher, she wasn't really, um, or she was not really prepared to unpack all of these really heavy themes that were in this book. And if you don't really, you know, read this book with a, um, with a critical lens, it can really uh, perpetuate racism in many ways. I think the most um, prominent one would be white uh, saviorism. And so rather the teacher kind of just tried to cover her bases. She tried to just like check off the boxes, um, you know, by having a book that at least had black characters and by using these social justice um, oriented resources. Um, but you know, as we've seen, this was not enough. The second major theme that we saw in um, seven out of the 11 stories was the oversimplification of student identity. And so what I mean by this is there was very heavy reliance on stereotypes or um, uh, tokenism in a lot of the stories. Um, as I mentioned previously in the presentation, um, a lot of the um, single story narrative. And what I mean by that is it's when you like reduce a race or a culture to kind of just one characteristic or one experience. Um, there was some instances of white teachers attempting to explain blackness to their students, um, which again, the students already, you know, that's their lived experience. So really they should be telling the teachers about that. And then overall, kind of just a failure to acknowledge the racial and um, racial and cultural complexity. So the story that really I think shows this theme very well was one that we called Swahili versus Spanish. And so what was happening here was um, with, an, with an intention to be anti-racist, um, an English teacher was trying to have a critical discussion that made students really think about their education and question why they learn what they learn. Um, however, this kind of led him into making a racist comment. Um, so he said in his story, I had the key question on the blackboard. Should there be such a thing as African-American History Month, why or why not? Then I pressed them about the requirement we had for them to take Spanish. Why, I wondered, did we not have a language more suitable to their culture like Swahili? To this day, I'm not sure where that example came from. And um, from this example, I, I think we can see that the teacher really reduced the, the richness of his Black um, students culture down to Swahili. Um, and he later found out that a lot of the students didn't even know what that was and they did not speak it. Um, so he did not, you know, really know about his students racial and cultural backgrounds, but he instead relied on an, um, on an assumption to make this point. 
And the last theme that we have to see, um, this was the most prevalent one, um, a lack of explicit anti-racist vision. And this was in nine out of the 11 stories. And so in a lot of these stories, there was kind of a lack of framing of the anti-racist work. And kind of an extension of that was there was a failure to convey the anti-racist nature of the work to the students. And so what I mean by that was the teachers really didn't explain like what they were doing um, when they were teaching the lesson. So I don't, so the students kind of had a hard time, I think, making the jump that the teachers wanted them to make. Um, and a very, um, um, interestingly, a lot of the stories didn't even really exp explicitly use the words race, racism, or anti-racism. Um, uh, so there was kind of a hesitancy to really handle these topics head on. And the last story that I want to share with you is one that we called a glossy lesson. And in this one, um, a English teacher was trying to be anti-racist by teaching a lesson about the differences between stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. However, she kind of relied on glossy examples rather than talking about things that were actually happening in the real world. Um, so for example, she shared that the way that she was trying to teach stereotypes was by using the example, all people with pink hair are mean. So kind of using this more like, you know, fairy tale, glossy type of example to express this point. And so what happened was um, in the lesson, she asked all of her students to find images that kind of showed what these terms mean. And she often got clip art, um, like the one I have um, on the screen, that was actually one that she got from one of her students. And so these, you know, this clip art, you know, it scratches at the surface of the topics, but doesn't really get at the root of the problem. And so she mentioned in her story, I had set us up for a genuine and real discussion about the ways that Black people are, are discriminated against in our country, both as a result of stereotypes and prejudice, but also as a result of laws and policies. However, I chose not to take that next step, partly out of fear, partly out of ignorance, and partly out of the excuse that there is always so much content to cover. So as we see here, the teacher really tried to be anti-racist, but in the quote, you know, she even acknowledges that she didn't take that important next step to kind of be boldly anti-racist. Um, also, the teacher did not share her intentions with the students. Um, and I think if she maybe would have offered a bit more scaffolding and support, um, that would have led to a more fruitful conversation um, that, that she wanted to have. So after all of this, my conclusion um, from this research project is that um, we still have a long way to go. Um, even the English teachers who are actively trying to be anti-racist can slip into racist ideas and practices. And so, you know, therefore, I really hope to encourage all teachers to be responsible for their, their behavior, to remain open to correction, um, especially from people of color, and also to be prepared to learn from your mistakes so that we can keep doing the anti-racist work that is so needed in our schools and in our world. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Josie. Um, would anybody like to ask Josie any questions? Uh, Sharon, go ahead. Thank you for that. It was really interesting. Um, I was particularly interested what you talked about at the beginning, the idea about making mistakes, um, because this is a pedagogy that I'm really um, hearing a lot more about. I've got kids, young kids in elementary school, and uh, they, they come home and they tell me, Mom, did you know that the only way to learn something is to make a mistake? And so they're getting really a lot of this. Um, and I actually think it's probably a pretty good thing that they're, they're learning that you make a mistake and that that's how you solve a problem or come to understand the, the truth. This is very John Dewey, right? John Dewey said, you don't learn anything until you perceive a problem, solve the problem. And um, so that leads me to this question of whether um, it's maybe that this whole anti-racist um, effort has to be done with, within a more experiential learning context. That is, if you try to do it within a classroom that's the traditional like lecture format where the teacher's the expert and the students are the students, where there's a, there's a power differential, that you're, you're always gonna have that situation where a mistake is feared and perceived as um, a threat to that authority. And that really the only way to carry it off is to create a classroom from the beginning where it's really a joint learning classroom, like in an experiential classroom where the students are the experts too, and they're presenting on topics and the teacher's learning from them and everybody's making mistakes, but learning. And then when racism comes up, it's not so scary because it's just another of the kind of um, problem we're working through. Um, so what's the question? So the question is, to what extent do you think it's possible to carry off 
anti-racism um, education within the traditional model. I mean, to, to me, it gives me momentum for experiential learning, which is, I know it's kind of a big buzzard right now. It's kind of trendy, but, um, but it's momentum toward uh, an equalization in the classroom. Sure, yeah, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of these um, situations come when the teacher thinks they're the boss, they're in the front of the classroom, they're doing all the talking. And I really liked how you kind of had them, you know, on like equal playing field. And I would even kind of put the students maybe even like a bit higher. Um, and yeah. so I don't really think that this kind of model is that far off. Um, I've really kind of seen it. It's, I mean, it's definitely kind of a slow move, but I kind of do see it, um, um, uh, like starting to happen um, just by giving students more, more, um, uh, control in the classroom, um, maybe having them lead the conversation, having them choose their own texts, um, you know, having them maybe even teach a lesson, you know, these are things that are actually very easily, um, like, um, um, applicable in the classroom. And I think the whole idea of like anti-racist teaching can kind of seem scary, but I think when you really break it down, um, these are things that can be easily kind of brought into the classroom on each day. Mm -hmm. So Josie, you know, a lot of your examples um, were from teachers who, who knew they failed, who had a goal and they didn't get, how did they know they failed? Because I'm also wondering how many teachers have no idea that what they're doing is just not working at all? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And we kind of saw a lot of different reasons actually um, how teachers kind of came to that. And so one of the big reasons actually was from their students. Um, a lot of times there was kind of a conflict with their students and the students would be like, why did you say that? Um, what do you mean by that? Um, and so I think a, um, a good amount of the stories actually kind of came from that. And so it was that kind of moment that the teachers were like, um, okay, I need to kind of rethink what's going on. It kind of made them stop. And they had kind of a moment of um, like critical consciousness, like, 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 what am I doing? Um, so that was um, a, a really big example. Um, other ones that were kind of happened as teachers kind of got further into their career. Um, so a lot of them would actually do their own um, uh, uh, research on their own and kind of through different um, uh, professional development opportunities um, by reading things. Um, one of the teachers actually had just read um, Ibram uh, Kendi's book um, as we were kind of doing this um, study and she said that completely changed her whole really outlook on her teaching and that after she read that book she kind of thought back and was like wow I have not been doing this right. And so I think those are the two that I've really seen um, kind of hearing from students um, and then also kind of just really self uh, uh, motivated uh, research by these teachers are kind of the two main ways that they knew that they had uh, made a mistake. Do you have a sense that, uh, that many or maybe even most instructors in these contexts don't know that they're doing it wrong? Or is that, do, do people figure it out? Um, I mean, the, I think that, I mean, specifically for this project, I was looking at teachers who did know, like I wanted the teachers who um, uh, like were anti-racist and I didn't really um, talk about this too much in my presentation, but I had like a first um, uh, um, interview for all these teachers and I had like a list of um, uh, criteria that they had to meet um, for them to be and like um, be uh, considered anti-racist teachers. And so I think the ones in my study had a pretty good understanding, at least in the examples, um, you know, that they gave that they like did make a mistake. Um, you know, am I getting the worst of the worst stories? You know, like, are there other examples out there that might, you know, be worse that they don't want to share with me? I'm um, sure that is definitely po like possible. Um, but I think that the teachers that I interviewed definitely had um, a understanding of, of what happened. Um, now, you know, talking about teachers as a whole, um, I do think there are some teachers who, you know, are not really, um, who are not exactly aware of this yet, or maybe like just kind of starting out on their, um, on their anti-racist journey. Thanks. Um, any other questions for Josie? Okay, Josie, great job, thank you. Uh, all right, our next presenter is Maggie Rayhill um, and uh, her, uh, her advisor is with us, uh, Professor Peggy Schauer is, is here. And um, Maggie's, uh, uh, Maggie's presentation is called uh, youth Participatory Action Research. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to make sure my connection is good. Is Can everyone hear me decently? Yep. Beautiful. Okay. Um, yes. So 
I am going to be speaking today about my experiences in a service learning program that I participated here uh, in John Carroll through the CSSA department, which led to a research study around the um, research philosophy of youth participatory action research. And so just to give you some background as to the program I'm going to speak about today, it was called Youth, it's, it is called Youth for Justice, um, a program in John Carroll's CSSA department uh, in which college tutors working with eighth grade students in three Cleveland schools on social justice projects in their history class. Um, the tutors involved are taking multicultural education with Dr. Schauer. And we have in its perfect time and not in COVID times, a semester of research and then a semester of action planning, which um, culminates in a final summit hosted at John Carroll in which the students are able to present their research projects kind of like this um, to a board of different adults, either in the John Carroll community or in the communities in which they are involved in. And so what is youth participatory action research? Um, youth participatory action research is based off of participatory action research, which has multiple origins um, dating back to around like the 20th century, mid 20th century. Um, the core focus of participatory action research is that instead of having a research model in which one person does the studying and the other person is studied, the person who is involved, who is being studied per se, is directly involved in the research process. So we're really getting into participatory and action as a part of that research process. Um, and so youth participatory action research is centered around youth experiences and how to incorporate youth experiences into the research process. Um, and it is centered around experiential knowledge. So experiences that are lived count as knowledge and therefore count as data. Um, it's focused strongly on developing relationships between researchers and communities, and there's always a movement towards action. So the research process doesn't stop at knowledge, it moves towards action. And due to the vast amount of people involved in and engaging in this process, there's no set methodology used, just a focus on these core tenets, and it's adapted in um, several different ways. And so in short, YPAR is a formal resistance that leads to transformation, systematic and institutional change to promote social justice. And here we see an image of some of our scholars at the last summit we were able to have back in 2019. And so what I did was I was able to conduct a literature review focusing on three main areas. So the first main area is, uh, the benefit of YPAR in impacting students' conceptions of their own agency. So student agency is a psychological need and human right, essential to becoming a, a non-autonomous, principled, goal-directed, and responsible being. And one of the main benefits of YPAR in the classroom is the impact it has on developing students' feelings of agency, both in their communities and in their learning. Um, and in doing so, students are able to analyze the social issues around them and be and develop the mindset that they are capable of changing and impacting some of those social issues. So instead of saying, this is what I see in the world, there's nothing I can do to change it. They are able to develop a mindset that says, this is what's happening in the world. It's a lot, but I know I can do something. And I know my peers and I can do something to change it for the better and make an impact right now, not when we're 25, not when we're 45, but right now as in this case, as we're eighth graders. And so I was able to work with a group of five students who I will keep this short because I could talk about them for probably two hours, um, just taught me so much about the capabilities that students have in order in affecting change in their communities. So in this group in particular, I was able to see them go from kind of a hodgepodge group who were struggling to get it together in the research process to a group that sat in front of a panel of judges and presented a powerful presentation on the impacts of homelessness and drug abuse in their community and offer changes to solve those issues. Secondly, 
YPAR has a major benefit to communities that are involved in this process. So these projects aren't only um, positively impacting the students who create them, but the communities around them. Uh, through YPAR, youth and communities are able to develop a strong relationship and are able to make more equitable communities through this process. As the slide shows, students cover issues ranging from racial injustice, educational inequality, critical literacy, women's rights, et cetera. And within the research that I was able to find, powerful examples included a high school student-led professional development. So a school switched from uh, taking professional development from administration to the students saying, the students say, this is what you need to learn as teachers. Um, there was an example of an anti-stereotyping sticker campaign and social media campaign from 2008, which is pretty early on in the social media world. But another example of how youth take their own experiences and say, this is the world we know. How can we impact it in a positive way based on the skills that we have? Um, additionally, they were able to, in another study, develop the youth developed a culturally meaningful curriculum development in public school district. And in our own summit, we were able to see around 100 eighth graders come together to present proposals to change their communities for the better. They brainstormed actionable items such as police officers coming to a school to have a community day in which a board of police officers sat and spoke with students about the tension within the communities um, that which they were in. Additionally, some students organized food drives to donate to their local food bank at their school, had campaigns of awareness around issues such as human trafficking and gender bias on social media and in their schools. So even in our own program, we saw actionable items in which our students were able to go from this research process and say, this is what we're doing to impact our communities for the better. And then finally, YPAR benefits teachers to be, such as myself and adults all around. And so when you are experiencing YPAR in, through the perspective of becoming a teacher, it serves as an excellent pedagogical tool for developing teachers because they are able to learn student-centered practices, observe students' strengths and capabilities, and develop a new understanding of the structural inequalities that impact the majority of students in urban schools. Additionally, they are able to learn the benefits of listening to and learning from students as they are mass vessels of knowledge and experiences and they bring that into the classroom each day. And so in thinking about all of the ways in which we've seen YPAR benefit the students themselves and the communities, additionally, the adults involved end up taking away just as much as the kids in the communities as well. And here's just a picture of some of the tutors I had the privilege of working with in, in the last few years who are all on their way, or actually probably by now, teaching in the professional world. And so in the end, as of right now, YPAR is not being well utilized in K-12 schools. The majority of projects are happening in out-of-school formats like after-school clubs and youth clubs. But the multi-beneficial nature of YPAR should speak for itself. And yes, there are hardships. There are no things in education that go easily and perfectly. Um, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, the benefits call for implementation because now more than ever, kids deserve to be heard as social issues continue to impact students from all types of life styles, and all ages, they deserve to have the space to be able to not only talk about and reflect on the issues happening in the world, but work towards change at where they are in this moment. And so next steps, um, hopefully continuing to uh, write a narrative literature review of my own experiences and the research I've been able to conduct so far. And as a pre-student, as a student teacher, implementing YPAR into my own teaching, and then the future as I continue to teach, and continuously, continuously advocating for greater participation in YPAR, and finally just more listening to and learning from students because each day I find myself in awe of the experiences they have carried and the knowledge that they can teach me uh, day in and day out.
And so that is all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Maggie? Uh, Maggie, I'm going to I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk about those kids that you clearly wanted to talk about. Um, so you can say whatever you want, but one thing I think you mentioned is that um, that their their work together started out kind of slowly, that they didn't really cohere, and eventually they came together and did something really special. So how how did they get it together as a group? How you know? How, what was the, how did they gel? What, what were some of the forces that brought them together? Um, I would say deadline, no, but um, <laughs> they, they work. <laughs> yes, exactly. They do work. But honestly, I think it started off as they didn't know how to do research. We not we weren't really aware. We're working in an eighth grade classroom, and so we're like, here, let's do research. And they're like, what is this? And um, a quick anecdote. Dr. Shower observed a class at one point and she saw one of my students copy and paste directly from a website into their presentation, no citation at all. Um, he earned the loving nickname of Jimmy copy paste. Um, and so eventually I think they realized that, oh my gosh, I have to go present this to a board of adults and I have to go to John Carroll and I get to go to this college campus and see like all of these really good presentations by my peers. Um, we really wanna do a good job at this. And so I think just the specialty of the occasion, like here is this platform, we wanna hear what you have to say, gave them the desire because we started in October, we didn't, they couldn't see May, but as May came around, they were like, we gotta get it together people. And they did. And I eventually you just sit back and you just watch and you're like, oh yeah, make sure your citation goes there. And um, it is very funny because I'm at a high school now and Jimmy copy paste is now a sophomore at the high school. And I just got to uh, reunite with him and it was such a special moment. And that's just like, I was like, hey, do you remember me? He's like, not really. What did, what? And I was like, I taught, I tutored you. He was like, oh my gosh, yeah. So it's just a great way to <laughs> develop relationships as a student teacher as well. Can I just add on that and to go on and Maggie's awesome job as usual. Um, but to your point, Dr. Kilbride about, you know, the, the, the motivation, um, sneak peek to this semester's um, research that is ongoing in, in the multicultural class right now. We're not able to do the Youth for Justice Summit with COVID and, and bringing kids and everything has been completely remote. And so this year's students in the, our JCU students in the course, um, I, I told them, you know, if, if the presentation, if the PowerPoint thing doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, and maybe there's other ways that um, the students want to um, express their learning from YPAR. And so it has evolved that one group is doing a podcast and they're highly motivated on the podcast. They're bringing in police officers. So it's the same topic on police brutality. Um, they're interviewing um, their teacher. Um, they're, they're just talking to all these people and they're really excited about it. And another group is um, talking about bullying and cyberbullying. And they're writing letters to their parents on what they wish their parents knew about you know, what's going on on the internet right, right now. So it's still why part because they're putting in all the research that they've learned and what they want is an actionable thing, but it's more authentic than the PowerPoint, right? And so I think that's an interesting thing moving forward. Um, and Maggie, I was going to ask you if, if there was anything in the literature about um, like more authentic learning other than the Google slide presentation, you know, or, you know, cause I, I thought that was, it's interesting. Yeah, for sure. I would definitely say there's a movement towards not necessarily presenting research, but again, acting on that research. And so um, we unfortunately, get, like myself especially, got to that point of the research by the time the, the summit had ended. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, we could have done this a little differently. Um, but definitely a movement in the research towards 
action and that is authentic that does mean something in the communities rather than just this is just school for schools per like the point of school like this is learning and knowledge for a specific purpose and i think um, going back to like the motivation that's what really gets students involved in the process because they go from learning in school where they feel like all I have to do is just this assignment because my teacher said so to, wow, I get to do this in class. And some days you don't want to do it in class, but eventually I get to do this and make actionable change in my communities. And that means something to me. Yeah, I just want to end this with, I think Dan made a good point in the chat about uh, what you said about students and not, not knowing how to do research. It's not that different um, for undergraduates. We forget that. Uh, sometimes that it has to be modeled, it has to be taught. Uh, we can't take these things for granted at any level, just saying, go write a paper, go do research. Whoa, slow down. Um, that, you know, that's, that people have to be taught that stuff and uh, at any level that's, that's true, I think. So thank you, Maggie, that was really great. So our final uh, presentation of, of the afternoon uh, is a uh, team effort uh, by Tristan Hansen and Celeste Johnson. Uh, on, uh, this is uh, supervised by uh, Professor Sharon Kay of Philosophy, uh, and it's called Take a Stand on Bioethics. So Tristan and Celeste, take it away. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Uh, can you guys see this? There we go, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so present. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay, uh, so hello, I'm Tristan Hansen. Hi, I'm Celeste Johnson. And uh, we're gonna talk about research that we did last summer covering uh, the topic of philosophy and areas of bioethics and the research that we did on that. So Celeste. Thank you. Um, so I'm a philosophy major and a senior and I've been working with um, the Philosophy for Kids program that Dr. K works. Um, pretty much the entire time that I've been at John Carroll for the most part. Um, Tristan as well works with this program. And um, last summer, uh, Dr. K reached out to us about an opportunity through the SURF program, the Collar and Weaver Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship, um, in which students work with faculty on research and then present that research. Um, and we thought this was a great opportunity for P4K because it allowed us um, to take work that has already been done in the program. We create uh, volumes for use in the classroom, um, which is what the P4K program does. We uh, take college students and we put them in um, fifth and eighth, through eighth grade student classrooms um, and we teach philosophy. And so we've been sort of creating, or, or I should say Dr. K has been creating um, the curriculum for this, the custom curriculum for this. And the SURF program allowed us to sort of do research and present on this research. Uh, yeah, and so a bit of background on how this volume is written. So, uh, so basically, there was a we so we constructed a volume of philosophical essays, and a first volume of this was written last year, uh, before we wrote the uh, work on this one, and it was published in September actually. And this is the cover. It was called Take a Stand. Hence the name of this one, Take a Stand on Bioethics, because this one's focused specifically on areas of bioethic topics. So essentially last semester, or I guess that would be uh, last year, uh, Dr. Paul Lurritsen's students uh, in his honors, bioethics honors course all wrote topics on a different side of a, of a given topic. So like um, research on minors, one person would write about why it's a good thing, one person would write on why it's a bad thing. And so then in, in that last summer, me and Celeste worked in uh, editing them and combining them into a single coherent chapter because they were separate originally. Uh, they, were, they weren't together. So we need to make sure they all were put together in a uniform, neat format. And so we combined them into a single bioethics second volume that will hopefully be published uh, relatively soon. And so this is an example of some of the chapters we worked on. Yes, so this was uh, my chapter that I wrote jointly with uh, classmate Joshua Hughes. I was in the bioethics class, um, Dr. Loritzens, and um, we wrote on the topic of should vaccines be compulsory for children? Um, and so uh, Joshua uh, 
wrote for and I wrote against. Um, my argument uh, took from the uh, work of Professor David, Ar David Isaacs, who argued that a government that makes vaccines compulsory is coercive and violates individual rights of its citizens. And then Joshua uh, wrote um, from the perspective of Al Alberto Giuliani uh, and argued that vaccines aid in reducing the spread of diseases that threaten society. Um, especially at-risk groups uh, such as children through herd immunity. So the goal through vaccines is herd immunity and everyone in our society is required to um, equitably contribute to the livelihood of that society. And in this case, it, it is most equitable to uh, be vaccinated and uh, create the phenomenon of herd immunity. Um, so one thing that I really, that was uh, really great about this project uh, in editing this chapter, so like I wrote half of it and then I got to edit all of it, was um, I had a STEM background. I was in STEM classes at the time um, before I switched my majors and um, I had all the research that I needed, but I needed to make this research accessible to um, young students that I would be teaching and that other P4K um, participants would be teaching. And so I had uh, my brothers who were uh, high schoolers at the time uh, read um, my chapter for me. So they were essentially my second readers instead of someone who was my peer or, or um, another professor. And I got feedback from them directly. And that was a really cool aspect of this project um, that allowed me to sort of ensure that this information would be accessible to students. Um, yeah, and then so uh, an example. So then I, added, so we, she had half and I added the other half and one of mine that I dealt with was transhumanism and the way it was argued. So this one was written by Derek Edo who argued for transhumanism and Raja Sharma who argued against. And obviously many of you probably haven't heard, heard of this, I hadn't until I uh, worked on it, was it's basically that transhumanism is the theory that we can, the human race can evolve beyond its limits, its physical and mental limitations, especially through the use of technology and, and science. So Edo uh, essentially argues with, argued within his chapter that transhumanism is a religion and it's a system of beliefs and a following that just like all other religions needs to be accepted and encouraged and not frowned upon. It should be accepted. Whereas Sharma, Ar Sharma argued that if we continue down the trade of uh, promoting transhumanism, it's going to cost mankind its valuable traits and make us eventually cease to be human practically uh, if we continue down this path. And this was for me, one of the most interesting chapters that we did, that I that I edited, because uh, not only is this a unique concept or unfamiliar uh, topic, uh, these, the idea of religion being used to uh, encourage a scientific area is very interesting, and the idea that we're losing our human traits was fascinating. So those were two arguments that we worked on through the summer to edit. So. Um... Another aspect of all of the chapters that we had to work on was we had to standardize discussion questions and we had to develop a classroom activity because these are like the core, I've been teaching P4K um, uh, classes for a while now, and this is a really big part of teaching these students is you need to have a way to engage them and you need to have direct questions. They're used to being lectured to, so it's really beneficial to ask them um, really challenging questions um, and then uh, sort of get them thinking about it, but also sort of like um, get them thinking about how they can apply it to real life situations and things like that. Um, so an example question would be, do you think clinical research on minors is acceptable? And this would obviously be like the question, the content would be scaled to um, the grade that is being taught. And then um, we put it with an example, listening and responding classroom activity. So a big, big part of philosophy is being able to um, uh, hear what your opponent is saying uh, and understand it and grasp it and not just, you know, spout your own position, um, but to really interact and engage with what um, your opponent is saying. So this activity was to promote careful listening. Um, and we had... Uh, we would have one student give an answer to the discussion question, and then we would have a, a, the sec a second student uh, repeat uh, word for word what that student said, and then sort of give a summary to demonstrate that they understand it, and then offer their own response to what the first person said. 
and then have a third student um, summarize what the second student said um, and then respond, offer a response, and then go around the classroom at least once to give everyone an opportunity to listen, repeat, and respond. Uh, and so uh, to wrap things up, we just, uh, we, we hope, obviously I mentioned, we hope this book will be used to broaden the philosophical horizons of K through 12 students, just as the previous volume is currently being used as, and that is our hope for the future. And we just want to take this moment to thank Dr. K for giving us this opportunity last summer. Uh, and we're very grateful. And thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone. Can thank I just much. add uh, quickly that um, just, was it two weeks ago, guys, that I received a message from the prospective publisher. So the, the publisher who published the last volume um, is Proof Rock Press. And we sent the new volume to her, when was it, almost a year ago? Well, it was last summer. When did you finish? Like it was maybe July? Yeah, right around then. And she just wrote back to us saying, uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that we're, it's still under consideration. And we'll, we're, you know, we'll, we'll let you know. And so I wrote to them and said, See, this is how long publishing takes in academia. You, just, you know, it could be it could be years down the road, and it, it worries me a little because this stuff is all really topical and um, current right now. But how long are they going to keep it in the in the waiting room? <laughs> anyway, we got our fingers crossed. We're still on the. We're still we're still um, hoping that it'll be published soon. Yeah, for sure, definitely, especially because it was really exciting to get the uh, first volume, because I also worked on that one. It was really amazing to see that and to be able to be like, uh, I've been using it for my for teaching class this semester, so I think it'd be really great for future P4K uh, participants to be able to teach this volume to their students. So I have, I have, I have to ask, um, I have to expect, maybe I'm wrong, but that when you go into these classrooms, this has to be one of the first encounters that these students have with philosophy. I mean, maybe it's, you know, maybe they've encountered philosophical issues before, but this is, this seems to be like couched as like, this is, these are philosophical questions. How do they deal with that? Are they, do you have to, do you have to do a lot of like ground breaking and explaining concepts or are these students like ready to wrestle with these ideas? Yeah, so um, it really depends. It's I uh, had a lot of friends in the program as well. And for me, whenever I start teaching a new class, because I've actually taught a lot of the same students, I like to stick with the same students because that is a thing where it's like, um, you need to meet students where they're at. And it feels like one semester of teaching isn't always adequate to really cover. I mean, philosophy is huge, right? Um, and you need to figure out what they like, what they're interested in, um, because otherwise they'll just be bored. So I always start with like a very basic, like here are the branches of philosophy. Um, and then I sort of, I'm, I'm like, here's the philosophy that I like to do. And then usually I'm teaching with a partner and they're like, here's the philosophy that I like to do. And it, it really depends on the individual students. I, I mean, I've had students who were really interested in like feminist philosophy from the get-go and like they already had stuff that they, they really wanted to talk about in relation to uh, feminist philosophy. And then, uh, I had students discover that they really, really liked ethics and they really liked um, to look at ethical dilemmas and stuff like that. That's a really, really popular one. Thought experiments are always really popular for students. They really, they really, the most universal thing that I've seen among students is that they really like the hands-on stuff. They really like to engage with the material in ways that are unusual because it is already unusual topics for them. And I, I just want to add that I'm uh, surprised. I think that kids are better at philosophy than I think you, most people would assume. Um, you know, they're younger, you think they wouldn't grasp these ideas, but I think, I mean, it's from, because I went in, I, like, like Celeste, I taught in person with these kids, and uh, you wouldn't think they'd know, but I think they have these thoughts and these ideas in their head, and they're willing to share them. If you just stimulate them with the conversation, enter the props, they have a lot to say, if you give them the opportunity. And I, I was personally surprised the first time I went in and taught these kids, and while it can differ, um, they can, uh, if you introduce the topic to them correctly, it, it can engage in quite interesting and well-developed conversations. Other questions or comments for Tristan and Celeste? All right, I think we are done. It is, it is late. So let me ask everybody to give one final group hand to Erin and Josie, Maggie, Tristan, and Celeste. Well done, guys. Great job today. That was some great stuff.
Okay, everyone. So I'll just say uh, good night to everybody and have a uh, terrific weekend. All right. And uh, have a great last three weeks of the semester. Okay. We're almost there. <laughs> so take care, everyone.